During the 1930s, the Great Depression spread throughout the country, shutting down plants and industries everywhere. Workers who could find jobs became more and more frustrated with the poor working conditions and low pay offered by their employers. Farrell Dobbs was just one of many who endured the hardships of being a common laborer at the time. His experience in the workforce made him appreciate the fact that it was laborers themselves who would have to work to change their working conditions. When Dobbs realized that the time was right for a general strike in the trucking industry of the Midwest, he and a group of like-minded workers jumped at the chance to unionize this industry. In doing so, they would permanently change the way laborers were treated in the Midwest. Farrell Dobbs was born in Queen City, Missouri in 1907, but he spent his childhood in Minneapolis and graduated from North Senior High School. After graduating, he worked as a manual laborer in the Midwest. Before the economy sank into depression, Farrell Dobbs favored the Republican Party and voted for Herbert Hoover. However, after experiencing the hardships of the Great Depression, his beliefs were pulled radically to the left. This change in political belief happened as the result of a coal workers' strike in the winter of 1934, which Dobbs participated in, during which yard workers went on strike when their employers refused to raise their wages or recognize any sort of union. The strike was not immediately successful, but it marked a turning point for unions in Minneapolis. It was the first time that any local employee organization had advocated for union recognition without being prevented by their employers or the Citizens' Alliance a powerful association of class-conscious industrialists, merchants, and lawyers. These people made it their job to stop all union activity in Minneapolis and keep it an open shop town, where workers who did belong to any specific union could not be hired anywhere. It was through this strike that Farrell Dobbs met Vince Dunn and Carl Skoglund, the two central leaders of the coal strike. As Dobbs got to know Don and Skoglund better, he learned that they were part of the Trotskyite Party, which was a group made up of people who supported the interpretation of socialism promoted by Leon Trotsky. Trotsky, who had been forced to leave Russia after openly opposing the political principles and economic policies of Joseph Stalin, believed that permanent political revolution by the working class was necessary in order to turn a country into a workers' democracy. Dobbs was fascinated by the ideas and principles of the Trotskyite party, and, soon, Dobbs decided to become a Trotskyite himself. Dobbs quickly found himself at the center of the Trotskyite party of Minneapolis. As an active member of the party, Dobbs studied labor conditions and the problems faced by the unions. He learned what unions stood for and what recognition of the unions could do for laborers. As time passed, workers' attitudes towards the Union changed greatly. Before the Great Depression, they had agreed with the Citizens' Alliance's claim that unions were organizations that would harm the labor industry. However, as the Depression went on and employers began to fire people and cut their wages, workers realized that they could not stand up for themselves or protest mistreatment without the risk of being laid off. As a result, they came to understand just how much unions were needed to keep their employers from taking unfair advantage while economic conditions made the workers vulnerable to abuse. When they noticed this change in public opinion, Dobbs and other Trotskyites decided to work to come up with a plan for unionizing Minneapolis's trucking industry, thinking that drivers had a better chance of being successful in strike because their work was extremely important to the entire state of Minnesota and, without them, Industries and businesses throughout the Midwest would suffer. Farrell Dobbs and a select group of Trotskyites joined the Brotherhood of Teamsters Local 574, which was an affiliation of truck drivers located in Minneapolis's market district. Because they were not drivers themselves, they could speak firmly to the leaders of the Teamster Local 574 with nothing to lose. Dobbs and his fellows began to plan every aspect of the strike in great detail. They knew that executing a successful strike would be difficult since many obstacles had been set in place by that powerful anti-union business group, the Citizens' Alliance. In addition, they faced opposition from the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Daniel Tobin, who supported unions but did not think strikes were an effective way of protesting against employers. 
After many unsuccessful negotiations, Dobbs realized that neither the employers nor Tobin would ever allow a strike, and that the negotiations had been a stalling tactic on the part of the anti-union alliances. Dobbs abandoned the attempt to gain permission and went forward with the planning of the strike itself. Women were recruited to form an auxiliary group to cook meals and tend to wounded strikers if necessary. Teenage motorcyclists were recruited to ride around the market and report abnormal activity back to strike headquarters. Dobbs and the Trotskyites' plan was to take over the Minneapolis warehouse district by using trucks to block key routes leading into the area. They intended to control traffic and prevent any trucking business from operating as long as the strike lasted. Because all the truckers own their own trucks, the employers found it impossible to hire other men to do the truckers' jobs. Police and deputies tried to intimidate the strikers with violent actions. However, the strike effort could not be defeated by mere hostility, it was too well organized, and after two deputies died in battle against picketers, the strike ended with employers agreeing to recognize the union as a legitimate authority that represented their employers. However, it did not take long for Dobbs to realize that the employers were not keeping up their end of the bargain. A list of over 700 cases of employer discrimination against workers who belonged to the union was compiled. Dobbs felt that this was more than enough reason to call another strike, and so, in June of 1934, the truckers went on strike a second time, using the same tactics as before. However, in addition to a woman's auxiliary unit, street patrols, and a numbered truck system, Dobbs and his fellows started their own publication, The Organizer, in response to the Citizens' Alliance's attempt to fight them with anti-communist propaganda. After many unsuccessful negotiations between the strikers and the employers, the federal government decided to intervene by sending two men, Father Francis Hawes and H. Dunnigan, to mediate the situation. Hawes and Dunnigan's plans were accepted by strikers but rejected by employers, who thought the plan gave laborers too much power. As negotiation continued, strikers were experiencing an increasing amount of violence from the police. When police and deputies opened fire on peaceful picketers, injuring 67 people and killing two, Governor Floyd Olson decided to declare martial law, and overnight, 4,000 National Guardsmen were patrolling the streets. This show of force by the government outraged strikers, whose leaders confronted Olson on July 30th, claiming he had no right to act as he had. The killings that occurred in the streets of the warehouse district shocked many people all over the country and swayed public opinion towards the strikers. This made employers more desperate for an end to the strike. Finally, on August 21, 1934, employers accepted a proposal from the strike leaders that provided for a hiring workers, union representation, and a procedure to settle wage disputes fairly. Farrell Dobbs emerged from the trucker strike a well-known figure in the world of labor. His work in changing the way truckers in Minneapolis were treated earned him the respect of union men all over the country. Dobbs stayed in Minneapolis, working with the union to organize strikes and manage union affairs until 1939. He then went on to run for president as the Socialist Workers' Party candidate in every election from 1948 to 1960. Farrell Dobbs and his participation in the trucker's strike resulted in employers' recognition of the union. The trucker's strike was the first strike in Minnesota to successfully defeat the powerful Citizens' Alliance, and its success was a big step forward for union supporters all over the country. This success was made possible by Dobbs' work in organizing the strike and his leadership and faith in his cause. Other major events in labor history, such as the passing of the Wagner Act, occurred as a direct result of Dobbs and his fellow Trotskyites' successful attempt to unionize Minneapolis's trucking industry. Dobbs was one of many who dedicated their lives to the fight for workers' rights. His actions in the trucker strike of 1934 benefited laborers everywhere who were being treated unfairly by their employers. He has played a major role in labor history and he will never be forgotten.